as we close out this last plenary session, I have to say what a blessing it's been to me personally. I trust it's so for you. I'd, I'd like to thank you for having joined us for these days. Uh, what a privilege to be at a conference such as this, and even more so for us, Emmaus Bible College, to be privileged to host this event and to serve you in this way. Our passion is for the Word of God and its impact in your lives, and I just want to conclude uh, a few departing comments before Dr. Bailey comes up with the verses from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, words that uh, beautifully express our desire for you. The words of our Apostle Paul, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. So we trust it to be the case. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you will do the things that you will do and will do the things that we command you, the things that you have heard from the word of God this week this weekend. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. So I do ask you to pray for Emmaus Bible College in the year ahead as you depart from this place. Uh, for our work throughout the year, there are uh, many complexities to a small colleges. There are financial issues. There are organizational issues, social concerns, and of course, beyond all that, spiritual concerns. We, uh, from a financial perspective, we always have needs, and it may, if you're a parent who pays bills here, if you're a student who has come here or is here, there's some right here, there's others around, yeah, you know that it's a burden, and even what is paid does not cover all of the costs. So we're thankful for the Lord and his people who provide. We're greatly thankful that the Lord allows this work to continue. Uh, we're thankful organizationally for those who work hard here. Uh, we have a wonderful team of faculty and staff. Uh, just think about those working in the kitchen even uh, this week. It's hot there, and they've served us with good food, and uh, they've done it with joy. So we're thankful for them. The the social need, you think about the environment from which our students come and the kind of baggage that many times they bring and that we ourselves have too, and that we need the help of the Holy Spirit and we need the work of the Lord and we need his wisdom to unravel and deal with it. What a blessing that the many problems that uh, we all have and that our students have from society, what a blessing to bring them to this place where we can teach them the things concerning himself, where we can apply the scripture to the kind of issues. What if they were in a secular institution experiencing some of the things that we experience with them? So what a blessing, what a privilege. So we pray that the Holy Spirit will guide this work and as we read in these verses, that the Lord will direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. We're thankful for uh, Dr. Bailey for your coming here and sharing with us. Thank you for Alex Strauch and for our faculty members here who have been teaching and also for the many seminars. Many of you have participated in teaching those seminars and we thank you for the rich diversity of the Word of God that we have been able to share this week. So at this time, I'll just pray briefly once again for you, uh, Brother Mark, that the Lord will bless your word. Uh, why don't you come on up and we'll pray together briefly. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ministry of uh, Mark Bailey and uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. We thank you for uh, the work that goes on throughout the world with men and women from these fine institutions. We thank you for his presence here, his teaching ministry tonight, and we pray that the Holy Spirit would work in our hearts as we listen and that he would have the right words uh, chosen and directed by you 
to reach deep into our lives, our hearts, our minds. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Phil. Well, good evening. Uh, on a Memorial Day weekend like this, thanks for sticking around to Saturday night. That's great. I know that some had to leave and get back for other responsibilities, and we understand that. But uh, thank you for being here, and thank you for the privilege for those who uh, decided that I should come or would uh, be invited to come. And it's a privilege for me to uh, be involved. I never take that for granted. Uh, I've never thought I deserved uh, to be in ministry. Uh, but God has placed me in ministry and called me to ministry, and uh, I've been on grace from day one, uh, and will be on grace uh, until he leads us home. I think there's a song, something about that. <laughs> well, uh, greetings again from Texas. A Texan was uh, walking across the Chihuahuan Desert, uh, desperate for water, and he saw something far off in the distance, and hoping to find water, he walked toward an image only to find a little old man sitting at a card table with a bunch of neckties laid out on the table. Surprisingly, the Texan said, please, I'm, I'm dying of thirst, can I have some water? And the man replied, I don't have any water, but why don't you buy a tie? This one, it looks like it goes, to, it goes with your shirt. The Texan shouted, I don't want a tie, you old coot, I need some water. Okay, don't buy a tie, but to show you what a nice guy I am, I'll tell you, just over that yonder rise there, about four miles away, is a nice restaurant. You walk that way, they'll give you all the water you want. The Texan thanked him and walked toward the hill and eventually disappeared over the horizon. About three hours later, the Texan came crawling back to where the man was sitting at the card table. The little old man said, I, I, I told you, it's about four miles over the hill. Couldn't you find it? The Texan, with a very raspy, dry voice, said, I found it all right, but they wouldn't let me in without a tie. Well, it's a little weird having grown up in Colorado half my life, lived in Phoenix half my life, to then move to Texas and find out that I was in a foreign country. <laughs> I've there been 32 years, so I guess I'm close to being a native or something like that, but uh, uh, I would never have moved to Texas if God had not called me to Texas, but I'm happy to be there because uh, he wants me there, and my kids and my grandkids are there, so I'll stay there. But... Uh, it's a, a privilege to be with you here in Iowa. Uh, I sort of surprised my wife when I told her I drove to Illinois today. And she said, you what? I said, well, I just crossed the Mississippi River and came back. I just wanted to do that. Then she said, oh, OK. So uh, uh, it was just sort of fun to play a game on her. But uh, let's bow for prayer, shall we? One more time. Father, for what we have uh, been listening to with other speakers and seminar instructors, for what your word has communicated, we are grateful. We're grateful that it is the living word of God that lives and abides forever. Thank you that it's uh, through your word that we're born again by an incorruptible seed. It's by your word that we're cleansed by uh, taking heed unto it. It's by your word that we grow from newborn to maturity. It's by your word that we understand your will. It's by your word that we proclaim that others come to know the Savior. It's by your word that you keep transforming us into the image of your Son. And we all, as Paul said, with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory, whereas by the Lord the Spirit. Would you do that again tonight in our midst? Uh, not because of the voice of the preacher, but because of the power of your word. And as we uh, leave here tonight and go to our respective places of influence and ministry and family and friends, would you uh, make us leaders who lead people toward you, the great shepherd of the sheep? As under shepherds, our job is just to take, us, take them to you. And help it never be about us, but help it always to be about you. And we ask, as we see that in the text tonight, that you would be pleased to reinforce that, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The times that I have been with you in these evenings, we have sort of uh, taken the three passages that were assigned to me, 
And these are uh, all new prep, new messages because uh, I haven't uh, done this series before uh, like this at all. And so this has been fresh to me and continues to be fresh. And I saw in my first passage the highlight of the Savior. In the second passage, I saw the highlight of the term master. And because of what's in the context of this passage, I see the role of Christ as defender. So on Thursday evening, we talked about our confidence in Christ as Savior. Last night, we talked about our commitment to Christ as master. And tonight, our courage from Christ as defender. Tonight, we're going to talk about finishing well. If uh, my buddy at uh, Walmart, and it's been my privilege to have been introduced to the former CEO, who's a dear friend, and we serve on a board of a Christian organization, Bible Study Fellowship together, Mike Duke and his wife Susan, who's been with BSF for a long time as an area advisor and teaching leader and so forth. So Mike and I get to talk to once in a while to, about his uh, experiences at Walmart, and uh, we had him over to the seminary for one of our leaderboard events when he was still the CEO, and I did a Q&A with him, which was really a whole lot of fun, but he's a wonderful guy, and uh, his uh, predecessor is Doug McMillan, who's a fine believer, and they both go to Fellowship Bible Church in, little, in, uh, in uh, Rogers, Arkansas, used to be called Lowell, but in Rogers, Arkansas. And if, uh, I was talking with him, if, if, if nine out of ten Walmarts in a particular state were not making a profit, what kind of a uh, conversation do you think there would be there at uh, Fayetteville and Rogers, et cetera, Benson, Bentonville? If uh, at Cupertino, Apple found out that nine out of ten of their uh, machines were faulty and were being recalled, what kind of a conversation do you think they would have at Cupertino, California? Well, statistics tell us that only one in 10 who go into the pastoral ministry stay in the pastoral ministry. So what kind of a conversation ought we to have at headquarters? And whether you have a singular pastor or a plurality of elders who minister, as in the Brethren Movement, one out of 10 is not a great uh, success factor in ministry. When I heard those statistics, I got a little concerned, and so I went back to our alumni department and said, what's DTS alike? What are we doing? And I'm pleased to report to you that eight out of 10 of our graduates have stayed in ministry for a lifetime. Uh, the irony of that is only about half of our students come expecting to go into full-time vocational ministry. So we're recruiting some along the side, but my joke is if you can get through Dallas Seminary, you can stay in ministry. <laughs> we're living in a time in which Christianity was once respected within our culture. I remember growing up in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, and our Christmas program at school matched the Christmas program at our church. Uh, no longer is that true. It was once respected, then it was tolerated. They sort of put up with us. Now we as believers in this country are being disrespected in the public square. Erwin Lutzer writes, obviously dark days lie ahead for the believing church. Since Christianity is no longer providing the consensus for our society, the freedoms Christianity brought to us are being destroyed before our eyes, and we're living at a time when humanistic thinking is coming to its natural conclusion in morals, in education, and in law. If we're to withstand the onslaught, he's talking about us as committed believers, we must be convinced in our own minds that we have a message from God a sure word that shines in a dark place, end quote. Our theme this week has been a courageous faithfulness. And if we're going to re remain courageous and faithful, then we're going to need to follow the instructions of a model who remained faithful in his calling, as we have it recorded in the scriptures all the way to the end. This section of 2 Timothy has much to teach us about finishing well. According to Prof. Hendricks, who's now with the Lord, Prof. with whom I had the privilege of team teaching for 28 years, uh, 28 wonderful years together, dear, dear friend, he said there are a hundred or so leaders' lives described in the Bible, two-thirds of which did not finish well. That's obviously a concern. And 2 Timothy is a final letter now of a lonely leader as he looks forward to his end. And though he has the testimony of having fought a good fight, having finished the course, having kept the faith, as we were reminded this afternoon, 
Dr. Chuck Swindoll's statement is still true. Leadership and loneliness go hand in hand. And he goes on to say, loneliness stops where the buck stops. Loneliness stops where the buck stops. If we're going to stay courageous and faithful, as we look at in verses 9 through 12, we're going to need to be realistic in our expectations. Paul was not an idealist. He, he, he had great faith and great hope, but he was a realist. So he says in verse 9, as he's writing to Timothy, make every effort to come to me soon. And while he knew that it was time for him to be poured out like a drink offering, as we saw this afternoon uh, through our brother's message, uh, uh, he, he, he didn't think death would happen to him immediately. He, he, he knew that the end could come and may come fairly soon, but, but he has enough uh, uh, experience with the delays of the Roman government system. Government efficiency, you understand, is an oxymoronic statement. Still is. But he says to Timothy, come to me soon. And then the explanation for why he wants Timothy in verse 10 is for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmanusia, or Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Oh yeah, pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he's useful to me in the ministry. He's useful to me for service. But Tychicus I've sent to Ephesus. When we're going to be realistic in our expectations... But we need to understand that ministry is a life of meaningful relationships. We, we see the emotional side of Paul here is probably nowhere else. The, the term, the phrase, make every effort, is the same word that we saw last night in chapter 2 and verse 15, which was the same kind of effort that he told us to have in our handling of the word of God, the word of truth. It's an urgent term. It has the idea of urgency and speed all in one. It's an urgent request to do whatever is necessary. Timothy, I need you, and I need you now. Why? Because of all the people movement in the relationships around me. In the midst of so much movement of people, Paul really desires the personal presence of his son in the faith, Timothy. His desire to see Timothy is heightened by the movement of his other associates. In this list, there are desertions. There's transitions. There's people leaving for missions. Some of these are bad reasons. Some of these are good reasons. Demas is departing. Crescens, Titus, and Tychicus are working. Luke is staying. Mark is coming. Alexander, we'll see, is opposing. Demas, you remember, has moved from being a fellow worker, as he is described in Philemon, verse 24, to one who has a love for this world that has taken him out of useful service for his Lord. He is, I think, an example in this book of what was been warned about throughout the book, of being ashamed of Paul the messenger and the gospel as the message. Uh, Crescens and Titus and Tychicus were working. Uh, we don't have any other reference to Crescens in terms of who he was and where he went, but uh, uh, heading to Galatia and uh, uh, these other guys, they had, they had responsibilities and, and they left. If you've been around ministry very much, you know that people move. And, uh, and, and, and business people are transferred, and ministry people are, 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 you know, find another calling, and uh, missionaries go across the seas. And the relationships that you build, it's realistic, are going to change. One of the greatest blessings in the 40-some years of ministry that I've had is the building of relationships. <coughs> Excuse me. At the same time, one of the most disappointing things is to see some of those relationships sour because of people who fall into sin, who depart from their testimony, who, who lose their edge, uh, or who uh, get, get, get called away to another kind of ministry. Uh, and uh, some way, that's the way the church grows on the one hand, and uh, uh, pastors are planted and leaders are planted, but on the other hand, uh, uh, sometimes you don't want to see it happen because uh, you've depended upon them and they become close, close friends. Uh, we... Uh, don't much know much about what they were doing, but they left. Demas was deserting. These three are working. Luke was staying. And Luke, uh, what, what, what a gift he's been to the Apostle Paul, obviously the author of uh, uh, the book of Acts and uh, uh, in the book of Luke. And 
Uh, he's been with Paul on his travels. He's been with Paul during his Roman imprisonment. It very well, very well may be that he's the amanuensis writing this letter for Paul from prison that will be maybe delivered, uh, you know, by one of these men. Uh, Luke had been a confidant, and he was still there. Then, and then I love the fact that he asked for Mark. If you go back in the text, you remember that there's a reconciliation that was needed because uh, Paul had earlier refused to carry Mark on his second missionary journey because he, he thinks that Mark was a, a failure in the field, according to Acts 13.13. 13. And the magnanimity of uh, Paul shows itself now as uh, Mark is called a fellow worker, as, as Paul writes Colossians chapter 4 in Philemon verse 24 during his first imprisonment. But now he indicates his desire to have Mark come all the way to Rome to be with him because I find him useful in the ministry. I, I, I love reconciled differences. Uh, over the course of uh, my ministry, I've had very few uh, major disagreements. But when, when there has been a, a disagreement and that it's been worked through, often that becomes a more precious relationship because uh, they've seen your humanness and you've seen theirs and uh, it takes the edge of pride off of it a little bit and we find out we're all people with clay feet. And I love the fact that here's Paul the Apostle at the end of his ministry looking back and saying, you know, uh, maybe it was necessary for, Paul, for Mark and I to, you know, split company then, but uh, I love what God's done in his life since then. I remember a graduate who was, uh, uh, when he was at the seminary, he was uh, a little cocky. He, he thought he knew a whole lot more. He thought he would be the instructor to the faculty. And uh, he's a very bright kid. And he came through Dallas Seminary and left us, went on, finished a, a graduate degree beyond us, has been faithful in the ministry. We invited him back to uh, speak in chapel, and uh, we went out to lunch. And, uh, but as soon as we got in the car, he goes, Dr. Bailey, I need to, I need to say something before we go very far. And uh, he just said, I, uh, I've learned a whole lot about ministry since I left here. And in his great humility, he basically was apologizing for being a little uh, heady. And uh, I, I love that. I, I just loved it. It, 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 uh, it. it cemented our relationship closer because here was a brother who had understood what God was doing in his life, had learned a whole lot, and he comes back around, and uh, there's this reconciling of the relationship and the value, and uh, he's terrific in ministry. And I applaud him and support him. Uh, I, I love when these kind of things happen. Uh, it's, a, it's a caution to us that we don't burn bridges that we can't rebuild pretty quickly. That we don't burn the, uh, the road that uh, uh, is a path back to a, a deeper and, and a, a, a more genuine relationship. Because ministry is all about relationships. Tychicus likely would carry 2 Timothy to its destination and replace Timothy in the ministry at Ephesus so that Timothy could respond to the urgency that Paul is asking for, and that is send Timothy here. Well, who's going to run the ministry at Ephesus? That's why I'm sending this guy. And then we have Alexander opposing. We'll pick him up a little bit later. But my point is this. If we're going to end well, if we're going to finish well in the ministry, we're going to finish well because we are going to be realistic in our expectations. We're not going to expect people to be perfect. We're not going to expect people to be permanent. We're not going to expect people to always be just the same patronizing voice to everything we think. Because if we're just exactly alike, one of us is not necessary. We need the different gifts of the body contributing to the ministry of the body in the spirit for the body. The ministry is a life of meaningful relationships. And that takes us to a second, and that is that we'll stay courageous and faithful and we'll finish well in the ministry if we're consistent in our preparations. If we're consistent in our preparations. Just a little short verse thrown in here, 413. He says, when you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus, and the books, especially the parchments. Bring the books, and especially the parchments. You see, the ministry is a ministry of the Word. Now, I want you to think what we have here. And this was so much fun studying. I, I get such a kick out of my studies. When Timothy brings Mark, just think about it, men and women. When Timothy brings Mark, 
you're going to have Mark, Paul, and Luke in the same place with the books and the parchments. Now think about that. You've got half of the gospel writers, Mark and Luke, and you've got the authors of over half of the New Testament with Luke and Paul in the same place with the books and the parchments. I mean, this is like a theological library, like at Emmaus Bible College down here. You got the goods in person. You got the major authorship of the New Testament coming together at the end of Paul's life, Luke and Mark and Paul in the same room. I'd have loved to have been a fellow slave, a fellow prisoner and going, hey guys, what do you think about this? Let them duke it out in front of me. This teaches us that we should never stop studying God's word. We should never stop learning from God's Word. A close walk with God leads a true Christian to want to know God better through knowing the Bible better precisely because he or she wants to know God better. Here's Spurgeon as he thinks about this passage. I love this. We do not know what books were about, and we can only form some guess as to what the parchments were. Paul had a few books, perhaps wrapped up in a cloak, and Timothy was to be careful to bring them. Even an apostle must read. (laughs) I love that. How rebuked we are by the apostle. He is inspired, in one sense, as we heard this afternoon, the text is the only thing that's said to be inspired, but he he, he is is used by God in this way, and yet he wants the books. He's been preaching at least 30 years, and he still wants the books. He saw the risen Lord, but he still wants the books. He had a wider experience than most men, and yet he wants the books. He's been caught up into the third heavens and heard things which is unlawful for men to utter, and yet he wants the books. He'd written a major part of the New Testament, and yet he wants the books. The apostle says to Timothy, and so he says to every creature, give thyself to reading. Brethren, what is true of ministers is true of all of our people. You need to read. Renounce as much as you will of all light literature, but study as much as possible sound theological works especially the Puritan writers and the expositions of Scripture. Luke, he goes on to say this, we are quite persuaded that the very best way for you to be spending your leisure is either reading or praying. You may get much instruction from books which afterwards you must use as a true weapon in your Lord and your Master's service. Paul cries, bring the books. Spurgeon says, join the cry. Join the cry. I think he needs his cloak because it's cold in that dungeon prison. He needs the books because that's what his whole life has been about. Then his whole life has been about. Well, number three, we stay courageous and faithful if we stay dependent in the midst of our rejections. If you've been in ministry very long, if you've tried to serve the Lord very long, you know you've been misunderstood, you've been maligned, you've been uh, slandered, uh, you've been disrespected, uh, you may have been lied about, you may have been opposed. So was Paul. He says, Alexander, he just calls him by name, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. But then he went, notice the maturity of the apostle Paul. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. See, Paul has preached and taught elsewhere, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Paul's willing to sign off on that and said, you know what, this isn't mine to deal with, God will take care of him. Alexander, the coppersmith, did me much harm, but the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. But nevertheless, Paul's not ignorant, be on your guard against him, he says to Timothy. Be on your guard against him yourself, Timothy, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. Alexander the coppersmith opposing. At my first defense, defense, no one supported me. Watch the loneliness. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. But may it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, he's not done yet. But he wants us to know that the ministry for God is dependent on the God of the ministry. The ministry for God is dependent upon the God 
of the ministry. There's the rejection of the leader, the rejection of his messenger. It was personal with Alexander. Uh, it, it bothered Paul. Paul, Paul was not a, a, in an armadillo you know, with a shell on his back. He, 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 it was a source of pain. It, it caused him harm. Uh, rejection hurts. Paul, Paul's a realist. This may be the same Alexander who was excommunicated as recorded in 1 Timothy 1.20 because of being opposed to the ministry and introducing false teaching. The author Spick, S-P-I-C-Q, presents evidence that the verb for did me harm, the Greek word could suggest supplying information to authorities as an informer. And it's thought in the reconstruction of uh, Paul's arrest that uh, it's very possible that Alexander was the one who was squealing and reporting him to the authorities so that he would be arrested again to be brought back to Rome. There's the rejection of the messenger, but he also says there was a rejection of the message. The first one's personal. This is propositional. And, and there's a warning for awareness. But Paul, in his warning, resists the temptation of retaliation. Again, I don't want us to miss the phrase at the end of verse 16. May it not be charged against them. Have you come to that point in your maturity? Were you willing to let God take care of those people? No. Were you willing to let God so take care of those people that he wouldn't make that the issue in their life? I need to tell you that that's grace going overboard. That's grace overboard. And, and by the way, though God is perfectly balanced in his attributes, there is a passage in Scripture that helps me know if God tilts, he tilts one way. It's a great verse for parenting. It's a great verse when you're a principal of a school or a president of a school. It's a, it's a great principle if you're a boss of a company. Where The psalmist says this, God does not impute to us all of our transgressions but he's overabundant in his loving kindness. My, that's hopeful. H having kids, two boys, we, we had some fun ways to deal with the discipline in our house when our boys were, 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 were boys and uh, when my sons were boys. Now they're 41 and 36 and uh, they're my best friends other than my wife. And uh, we, we, we designed a little discipline that was really helpful. We, if, if either of them cried, they both got disciplined. Now, let me tell you why that was cool, because the older one wouldn't persecute the younger one, and the younger one wouldn't squeal on the older one. And in a little house that when we first moved to Texas, one was eight and one was three, and uh, we had a little upstairs, uh, you know, that was open, uh, sort of an open balcony up the stairs, and bedrooms were up there with the boys, and uh, we had a little uh, den up there, and, and uh, we could hear them up there every so often going, shh, shh, it's okay, it's okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, don't tell dad, don't tell dad. <laughs> And that would change which one was saying that. They, they learned from each other. Because they knew if either of them squealed, then uh, somebody was in trouble and they're both going to get disciplined. That was a magic, magic portion you know, for, for that. The other one, we had a garage that uh, in Texas with the wind and the dust needed to be you know, cleaned out, swept out, all the stuff put back. And they, they got out of line. I said, I think the garage is calling. And the worst thing kids want to do is clean the garage. So I said, I think the garage is dirty. No, no, Dad, we'll, we'll straighten up. We'll straighten up. So uh, we, th that still hunts them when we say the garage needs, th they just sort of jerk. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of laughs. They, they told us a couple years ago they used to put pillows on the ground floor and jump off the second story onto pillows on the floor. Yeah, what is what we said? <laughs> My wife says, it's a good thing you didn't do it when I was home. They said, oh, yeah, you were in the, in the bedroom sewing and we did it. She didn't like that at all. She didn't like that at all. Now, now I want you to see this. Abandoned by most everyone in his ministry, he's facing the toughest time in his own ministry, and he echoes the words of Jesus from the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. I wonder if the words of Stephen came back to his memory when Paul, as Saul, ordered the witnessing and ordered the witness excuse me, and witnessed his stoning of Stephen while holding his cloak. And Stephen echoed the words of Jesus, Father, forgive him. Now Paul, in that great line of Jesus and Stephen, has these who have opposed him, have hurt him, have slandered him, have caused him harm, and he says, may this not be held 
against them. All he had to lean on was his faith in Jesus. And Jesus always proves to be enough. If you and I want to finish the Christian life well, you're going to have to have realistic expectations. You're going to have to constantly bury your mind and heart in the Scripture. And you're going to have to lean on Jesus. How? Well, the protection from the Lord is the answer to the opposition that he experienced. I want you to catch it phrase by phrase with me for a moment. By his presence. By his presence. That's how God protects us. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm studying Joshua in my private time right now as well. And uh, the presence of God was the key to their conquest of the land of Canaan. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. Take courage. Don't fear. I'll be with you. And here he says, the Lord stood by my side. Uh, in the Old Testament, there's a great phrase. Uh, the Lord is at my right hand. I love going to Israel and have been there many, many times, and I love taking people to uh, where the entrances to the old cities and the archaeological remains are there. And there, there is a rounded corner uh, right here. As you come up a city, they would put them next to the wall, and you would come up this way, and you would turn in on a left-hand turn. And if this is the doorway, even today, this is worn off, and this is pr still pretty you know, square. And the reason for that is that they, they wanted to neutralize the shield of the person walking in, and so they made them, you know, right-handed is normal. Are you left-handed? When you get to heaven, it'll be taken care of. It's okay, okay? Okay? God's right-handed, I think, but that's okay. It won't matter. But if you have a shield here and you make the turn, it neutralizes your shield, and you're exposed like this. But if you're standing in a ray, and you're standing here, and somebody's standing here, their shield is your defense. Your shield is the defense for the person left of you. So when the Lord says, he stood beside me, in the Old Testament, it's the Lord is at my right hand, means he's in the position of being a defender of me. And so the protection that he claims is the presence of the Lord who stood by his side. Second, it's with his power. He gave me strength. Not only did he defend me at my side, but he also empowered me. He gave me strength. That's his power. So protection by his presence, with his power. And then he says this, through his proclamation. The purpose of all of this as you read it. He says that the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that, here's the purpose, that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles, literally we could say all the nations, might hear. For what reason was Paul called into the ministry? You remember in Philippians that he was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. He was called to, to, uh, uh, you know, and, and to suffer for his name's sake. Peter was the apostle to the Jews, and Paul as a Jew was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. That in me the messenger, the gospel, the message might go to the world. That's the mission. That's the proclamation. And then he says it was in his protection. It was by God's presence, with his power, through the proclamation, but it's in his protection. He says, I was delivered from the lion's mouth. A lot of ink has been spilled on this passage. Historians tell us that the lions in Rome weren't introduced to the Colosseum, you know, killings of the Christians until four or five years after this time. Uh, we also know that uh, if he died a martyr's death, he wasn't delivered from the lion's mouth. So what in the world does this phrase mean? And I think it's the same thing that Peter says, your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring what? Lion. I think what he's talking about here is that in the midst of all of this, imprisoned, persecuted, stripped, beaten, Paul suffered horrendous, horrendous persecution. He wasn't spared from any of that. But he was protected from the enemy. The Lord delivered me from the lion's mouth. I think that's through his salvation and for his ministry. He experienced the protection 
of Jesus. And finally, according to his promises. Or next, according to his promises. Notice what the text says again. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth, and here comes the promise, and the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. Even if that means martyrdom. Even if that means death. Remember Jesus, when he sent the twelve out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel in Matthew chapter 10. And he in essence said, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a student is not above his teacher and a servant is not above his master. If they call the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more will there be the members of his house? And then he says, therefore, don't fear those. Don't fear those that will say things about you. In other words, uh, uh, he says three times in that passage on discipleship there, don't fear, don't fear, don't fear. Don't fear what they say about you. If they said this about me, they'll say it about you. Don't fear. Second, he says, don't fear those that can uh, kill the body and after that can't do anything. Rather, fear the one who, uh, after he has uh, taken you out, can send your soul to hell. It's another way of saying, don't fear men, but fear God. Fear God. His third fear is uh, don't fear the loss of significance. God can count every hair on your head. For some of us, that's harder than others. We won't go there. God who sees a sparrow fall, and some of us who grew up shooting sparrows feel a little guilty about that because God saw it all. But there were a lot of them. <laughs> Sorry. He's, it was youthful, you know, mistakes, Okay. But he says, don't fear, because uh, whoever confesses me before men, I'll confess him before my Father who's in heaven. Jesus said, I got it under control. They, they may slander you, they may slay you, they may uh, talk you into insignificance, and you may be intimidated into insignificance, but relax. If you don't love me more than all the other relationships around you, you're not worthy of me. It's a challenge. It's a challenge factor. But the promise is that the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. And then it says this, and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. See, if the worst thing happens to me, <laughs> I'm there. You know, Paul said it in Philippians 1. Uh, For to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. You know, absent from the body, I'm present with the Lord. You know, I, you know I, there's a need for me to stay here, but man, if I go there, hey, that's even better. Presence of the Lord. What, what, what better could there be? And so he says, he'll bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. And then that results in the praise. Then comes the praise. To him be the glory forever. Amen. For his praise. Now don't miss this. How's the protection of the Lord working? By his presence, with his power, through his proclamation, in his protection, according to his promises, for his praise. Not a bad philosophy of life. Not a bad way to say, that's how you finish well. That's how you finish well. Well, finally, we're going to stay courageous and faithful and finish well if we're genuine in our appreciations. We've said it before, but let me say it again. One of the greatest blessings of ministry that I've experienced is the fulfillment of what Jesus promised. Nobody has left houses or lands or family for my sake who won't inherit many times as much. And if that wasn't enough, eternal life to boot. I have been in the ministry over 45 years. I've got more friends than I can count. I've got more vacation homes than I'll ever use. I've got friends who said, hey, we've got a cabin in Colorado. I, last thing I want to do is travel. It's what I do for a living. <laughs> you know, I, I know it's, it's, it's a great offer, but I, I'm gonna, I do staycations. In my backyard, okay? I want to be home. Uh, but I, I've got friends. I, I, I'm on the phone. With, with friends I made 40 years ago in the 1970s when I started in ministry. I've got friends who we stay in touch. And I've I got so many friends I can't keep track of them all. And, it's in, and, and the colleagues around the table that I get to serve with, they've been with me almost the, the 18 years I've been president. We've had pretty much the same group around that table. The faculty with which I have the privilege of serving, we've grown old together. Uh, it, it's the incredible privilege. I've often had a philosophy. I just want to find some people who trust me and I can trust them and we're going to grow old together serving the Lord. Uh, I, I love the relationships of the ministry 
And Paul, if you study all of his, his passages, all of his epistles, and, and you take a list of all the people he knew personally and prayed for continuously, it'll be a great conviction. So here he says, greet Prisca, which is a, the, the more re- reverent term for Priscilla and Aquila, and, and the house of uh, Onesiphorus that we heard about earlier this week. Erastus remained at Corinth. Trophimus I left sick at Miletus. Make every effort to come before winter. Why come before winter? Because it's nasty to travel in the Mediterranean world during the wintertime. So he's saying, Timothy, I want you quickly and make sure you come before winter. Eubulus greets you and so does Putin's and Alinus, that's not out of the cartoons, and Claudia and all the brethren, the Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. You see, the ministry is a life of meaningful relationships. The ministry is a ministry of the word. The ministry for God is dependent upon the God of the ministry. And here we see that ministry is always a team effort. It's always a team effort. The Christian life is lived in the company of friends, and we should be thankful for them. I'm so impressed about how Paul related to people in his life and ministry. He had healthy relationships with both men and women. Don't miss this. He mentions Prisca, and you remember in uh, Titus, he tells us how to treat women. He tells how to treat older women, how to uh, treat older men, how to treat brothers, and how to treat younger sisters in the faith. And he uses the term Prisca. Luke always uses the diminutive form of Priscilla, which is sort of like little Prisca. But Paul's use may show his great respect for this lady. He always mentions her first, whatever she's mentioned. Feminists like to call Paul a misogynist, but that can't be farther from the truth. Paul loved people, and his letters show that love in his greetings and the salutations of his letters and his respect and his love for both the men and the women of the ministry, ladies like Phoebe and Claudia and Prisca and others, he had a high regard for godly ladies, and so should we. Life and ministry is lived in the company of Christians, friends, and colleagues. And you and I won't finish well. You and I won't finish well unless we make and maintain such valuable friendships in the body of Christ. Paul finishes with uh, grace be with you. Paul knows that Timothy needs the grace of God. The hymn writer said it well, grace has led me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. If you and I are honest, grace is the ultimate explanation for why any of us make it. Grace is the ultimate explanation for why any of us make it or make any contribution for God. You and I will finish well when we derive our courage from Christ, who is our defender. Stay realistic in your expectations. Stay consistent in your preparations. Stay dependent in your rejections. Stay genuine in your appreciations. The master was searching for a vessel to use. Before him were many, which one would he choose? Take me, cried the gold one, I'm shiny and bright, I'm of great value and I do things just right. My beauty and luster will outshine the rest, and for someone like you, master, gold is the best. The master passed on with no word at all, and looked at a silver urn, narrow and tall. I'll serve you, dear master, I'll pour out your wine, I'll be on your table whenever you dine. My lines are so graceful, my carving so true, and my silver will certainly compliment you. Unheeding, the master passed on to a vessel of brass. Wide mouth and shallow and polished like glass. Hear, hear, cried the vessel, I know what I'll do. Place me on your table for all men to view. The master came next to a vessel of wood. Polished and carved, it solidly stood. You may use me, dear master, the wooden bowl said, but I'd rather you use me for fruit, not for bread. Then the master looked down on a vessel of clay. Empty and broken, it helplessly lay. No hope had a vessel that the master might choose to cleanse or to make whole or to fill and to use. Oh, this is the vessel I've been hoping to find. I'll mend it and use it and make it all mine. I need not a vessel with pride in itself, nor one that is narrow to sit on the shelf, nor one that is big mouthed and shallow and loud, nor one that displays its contents so proud. Then gently he lifted the vessel of clay He mended it and cleansed it and filled it that day. He spoke to it kindly. There's work you must do. Just pour out to others 
what I pour into you. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the model of Paul. Thank you for the mentoring of Timothy. Thank you for the vision of uh, others who will be faithful to be taught us and committed to the ministry also. Thank you for the multiplication and reproduction of the ministry because it came to us that way. Somebody poured into us what you had poured into them and you reached us through them. Paul evaluated it right in Corinthians when he says, we have this treasure, but it's in clay vessels because the treasure is not in the clay. The treasure is in the content that we as clay get to hold and pour out to others. Help us be faithful. Help us to be courageously faithful. Help us finish well with the model of Timothy and Paul and other mentors for which we're very grateful who have uh, come into our lives, who've encouraged us along the way. As others have said, we're all like uh, turtles on a fence post. Somebody put us there. We didn't get there on our own. Thank you for the spiritual turtle lifters in our lives. Would you allow us to be turtle lifters in others' lives? And move them a little closer to our Savior, our Master, our ultimate defender, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.